I am Reverend Roderick C. Davis, and it's important that you understand I am not about religion. For God did not create religion, men did, which as Jesus taught, they did to suit their needs and traditions. My documentaries are about God's true word, as it was handed down to mankind through the Holy Spirit and prophets, and his son's doctrine, as it was recorded by Apostle John, and also by Clement of Rome, an early church father who had been personally trained and appointed to be a church father by Apostle Peter. Those writings, along with the Old Testament of the King James Bible, King James Version, and the Catholic Bible of the same era, provide all the knowledge required to enable one to judge which lessons contained in the Old and New Testaments are of God, and those lessons in the New Testament that are of Jesus, and those that are in the Old and New Testaments that are of men to suit their needs and traditions. Jesus preached to his disciples and followers that each and every one of us, through him, has a direct connection to our Heavenly Father. And he also told his disciples in Lection 44, verses 7 and 8 of the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, verse 7, But there shall arise after you men of perverse minds, who shall through ignorance or through craft suppress many things which I have spoken unto you, and lay to me things which I never taught, sowing tares among the good wheat which I have given you to sow in the world. Verse 8. Then shall the truth of God endure the contradiction of sinners, for thus it hath been, and thus it will be. But the time cometh when the things which they have hidden shall be revealed and made known, and the truth shall make free those which were bound. Before going any further, I want to share a statement with you from author Lionel Christopher Parkinson's book, The Holy Virus. The fundamental rule in the engagement of rational thought is that if your basic premise is wrong, then all specifics that follow in your chain of reasoning are also flawed. In fact, they are worthless. To build a case with an array of seemingly persuasive points is meaningless if one starting point is flawed. Keeping that statement in mind, I must establish my starting point by sharing with you information I uncovered regarding two well-known individuals in biblical history. Apostle to the Gentiles Paul, who lived in the first century, and Roman Emperor Constantine, who lived some 200 years later. Both of these men had a dramatic impact on the lessons that are contained in the King James and Catholic Bibles, and I will begin with Roman Emperor Constantine. By the way, a link to my documentary, Apostle to the Gentiles Paul, is provided at the end of this video. History tells us Roman Emperor Constantine had his wife Fausta and his son Crispus executed because they stood in the way of his agenda. And it also states he had them executed because of infidelities. There is far more historical information than the little bit I have shared. But based upon my studies, I believe the reason is the former and not the latter. For historian Adrian Goldsworthy wrote, Constantine would not hesitate in killing his own relatives when he felt this was necessary. Goldsworthy's statement, when he felt this was necessary, is akin to stating, if it stood in the way of his agenda. I mentioned earlier Jesus' doctrine that had been recorded by Apostle John, and that writing today is known as the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. Early church fathers wrote about this gospel, although they identified it as being a lost gospel, and they proclaimed it contains Jesus' original doctrine. That gospel had several names attributed to it at the time, one of which had been the Gospel of the Nazarenes. And early church fathers declared that the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, were all based upon it. Through my intense studies of the Gospel of the Holy Twelve, and the Gospel according to John, King James Version, I am convinced that John is also based upon the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. For I learned that many verses within the Gospel according to John 
are word for word, or close to being word for word, of verses that convey the same accounting within the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. By the way, a link to download the Gospel of the Holy Twelve is provided at the end of this video. I also mentioned Jesus' doctrine, which had been recorded by Clement of Rome, and his writing is known as the Clementine Homilies, and it contains one of Apostle Peter's epistles, plus a record of the doctrine he preached, and the messages of the lessons he preached mirror the messages of the lessons Jesus preached as they were recorded by Apostle John within the Gospel of the Holy Twelve. I have one more by the way for you. A link to download the Clementine homilies is provided at the end of this video. Apostle John wrote the Gospel of the Holy Twelve while incarcerated, and once completed he ordered a trusted individual to hide it, and he did so to protect it from falsification. Proof that fear of falsification would have driven him to hide it in a safe place can be found in chapter 2 of Apostle Peter's epistle to Apostle James within the Clementine homilies. The Gospel of the Holy Twelve was discovered by Catholic priests in 1870 and was translated by Reverend Ousley. However, when the Vatican learned that it contained doctrine which had not been authorized by the First Council in Nicaea 325 AD, they chose to not make the information public. Thankfully, in spite of their decision, it still ended up in the hands of the public. History tells us Roman Emperor Constantine convened and presided over the First Council of Nicaea 325 AD in an effort to bring unity between the various religious factions, and he intended to do such by having the Council determine authorized church doctrine. Scholars, based upon evidence I will soon discuss, are convinced that he exercised his influence upon the attending bishops to fulfill his preconceived agenda. I state preconceived agenda, for before convening the council, he ordered the confiscation of Jesus' doctrine that had been known to be in circulation. By the way, based upon information contained in the Clementine homilies, I am convinced Apostle Peter had been the author of most, if not all, of Jesus' doctrine that had been confiscated because of Constantine's order. Before getting into the supporting evidence surrounding the First Council in Nicaea 325 AD, I need to point out the fact that five years earlier, Constantine failed to resolve the Donatist controversy in 320 AD wherein he attempted to coerce the church into doing his will. And like any staunch politician, he learned well from that lesson. Be sure to keep that Donatist information in mind as you absorb the following historical evidence. It is documented that Constantine invited 1,800 bishops to the First Council in Nicaea, which he convened and presided over in 325 AD. Depending upon which attending bishop's headcount you rely on, between 220 and 318 bishops attended. If you use the greater of those numbers, 318, it represents only 18% of the bishops who were supposedly invited. 18% is an amazingly small percentage when you take into consideration that the meeting was of significant importance. Constantine supported the church financially. He had an extraordinary number of basilicas built. He granted privileges like the exemption from certain taxes to the clergy. He endowed the church with land and other wealth. He also offered to cover the travel expenses of bishops coming from the far-flung corners of the empire. Yet, still, only 18% showed up. Could it be that only 18% of the bishops were actually invited? When asking yourself that question, keep in mind the lesson Constantine learned in his 320 AD Donatist defeat. 
It's well documented. Constantine was a very aggressive and manipulating politician. Thus, it does make sense that by inviting only those bishops with whom he knew he'd have the greatest chance of obtaining approval of his agenda is an extremely realistic probability, especially when one takes into consideration he would not hesitate in killing his own relatives when he felt this was necessary. I want to give you another point to ponder that ties with the 18% of the bishops who did attend the First Council of Nicaea. When the final vote was taken to determine the authorized church doctrine of the day, there were only three dissenting votes. Doesn't that seem a little strange to you? Based upon those numbers, it certainly appears Constantine had the deck stacked in his favor. While none of Jesus' apostles endorsed Pharisee Saul, Paul, as being an apostle, Constantine did endorse the doctrine he preached over that which had been preached by Jesus. And there is a major problem with the fact he did such. Jesus, as did prophets before him, preached against certain revered Hebrew laws that had their beginnings in Genesis and Exodus. And there is a mountain of evidence which supports my statement, and that is addressed in other documentaries which are included in the description section of this video. There is another very important fact I want to bring to your attention. It is documented Constantine had Jesus' doctrine that he had ordered to be confiscated destroyed after the First Council of Nicaea 325 AD concluded their meetings. However, I should also point out that there are some historical writings that indicate they were not destroyed until 380 AD under the rule of Emperor Theodosius. In either case, they were destroyed. Thank God for the foresight of Apostle John. This concludes my Roman Emperor Constantine documentary. I encourage you with all my heart, soul, and mind to study the information contained in the links that are in the description section of this video. And the title of those links are Apostle to the Gentiles Paul, Old Testament Proves Crucial Doctrine Jesus Preached is Not in the New Testament, The Gospel of the Holy Twelve, and the Clementine Homilies. Thank you for taking time to learn and humbly serving Almighty God, I call upon him through his Son to shower abundant blessings upon you and upon all those whom you cherish. Amen and Amen.